Welcome to our Decoding Jazz Standards series, and we're studying Alice in Wonderland. By the end of this unit, you will be able to play this song by memory and in any key. Not only that, you will also have a bunch of harmonic techniques to reharmonize the song in real time. So with unit one, we're gonna be using Alice in Wonderland to learn a bunch of concepts in harmony so that you can not only learn how to play Alice in Wonderland, and transpose it into any key, but also to use these new harmonic perspectives to approach any jazz standard. Let's take a listen. So with unit one, we're gonna dissect and break down the most fundamental aspect of this song, or any song really, and that's the bass line. So our song's in the key of C, and uh, so you're gonna see all the notes in the C scale show up in this initial seven measures. We're gonna break down the first seven measures to start talking about the bass line. And if you do that, what you're gonna see are a D, G, C, F, B, E, and A, which are all of the notes in the C scale. Not in a linear fashion, mind you, not in a way we're normally used to seeing a scale, but rather superimposed onto the circle of fifths. So in Tessitura Pro here, we have exactly that. We have our C scale mapped around the circle of fifths. And you'll see exactly what's going on in the first seven measures of Alice in Wonderland if you see the C scale from this perspective. So you'll see D, and then one note over G, and then another note over C, F, and then across the graph, B, E, A, and then we're back to where we started it again on that D. It's also helpful to see this scale um, by way of the scale degrees. So now what we do if we start on D, we can start on any note really, but our song starts on D. We see it now from this perspective of two, five, one, four, seven, three, six, and then back to two. D, G, C, F, B, E, A, D, G, C, F, B, E, A. So one thing worth noting is that all of these intervals are fifths as we travel counterclockwise around the circle, except for uh, the F to the B. You see that diagonal line connecting F to B across the circle of fifths. This is a tritone, and this always happens between, we look at the notes again by way of the scale degrees, between the four and the seven of any major scale. This is worth noting, because as we spoke about earlier, we're gonna be trying to transpose this piece, or be able to play it in any context, in any setting, in any key, at any time. And these perspectives of seeing the purpose or the functions of the notes and the harmony is really important. So I'd like to make that, that um, that connection between the four and the seven of the scale being a tritone, and then every other note on the circle of fifths being a fifth. So this idea of following the notes of a scale around the circle of fifths is really crucial to our song, especially when we start on the two. Um, all sorts of really cool things happen when you do that, like two five ones, or six two five ones, or three six two five ones, all are a consequence of this idea of following notes of a scale around the circle of fifths. So you could see, uh, I guess from one perspective, that learning this bass pattern is essential to learning Alice in Wonderland. Uh, but this bass line is not a consequence of us learning Alice in Wonderland. It's actually the opposite. This sort of movement in the bass is so fundamental and so important you're gonna see it in so many other songs, which is why we're going to suggest that you learn all 12 of your major scales in this fashion. So you take the notes of any scale, start on the two, and then just follow the notes of the scale around your circle of fifths. So the issue with this is it's seven notes, so it's kind of, kind of weird. Uh, so we're gonna round it out a little bit and make it eight measures uh, via eight notes by just doing this one simple thing. Uh, we're gonna go D, G, C, F, B, E, A. And as an approach to get back to the beginning again, to get back to the D, to get back to the two, we're gonna approach it by way of a half step from above. 
So that'll give us a nice round eight measure exercise and a nice even number of notes. Let's try the same exact pattern in the key of E flat. Two, five, one, four, seven, three, six, and then we're going to approach the two by way of a half step from above, and then rinse and repeat the pattern again and again. We have a related video that you guys can check out. We have a play along content that you can do this workout in all 12 keys. Check that out. So now we're gonna to go to our MDEX Wheel of Harmony and randomly pick one of these harmonic techniques, see if it exists in our song, and if it doesn't, we're gonna find a place where we can apply it. And remember, it's from the perspective of these harmonic techniques that you can truly understand your music, which will allow you to memorize it, play it in any key, or reharmonize it on the fly. So let's spin the wheel and see what we end up with this time. Sub five. All right, the sub five. Let's go work on this. So you can always find a sub five in your song when you see a dominant chord a half step above of whatever it's targeting. So that gives us this sound. So there we have everything I just spoke about. A dominant chord, the E flat seven sharp 11, uh, targeting by way of a half step above the chord it's going to, in this case, D minor seven. So if you ever see a dominant sounding chord or a dominant chord going a half step down, you can see that as a sub five. The cool thing about our, our jazz standards progression book is we have all this information already encoded into the chart. So anywhere you see a dotted line, uh, a dotted arrow, those are indications of sub five. And when you see the solid arrows in the chart, that's just indicative of a dominant chord uh, either going to a tonic chord or tonicizing another chord. So you get this 5-1 dominant to tonic sound. This is important as it relates to what we're gonna do next, which is apply the subdominant sound somewhere else in the song. So we just found out where it actually exists. Let's see if we can interject it elsewhere within the piece. So the first thing I'm going to do is look for any sort of uh, solid arrow, because that indicates a sort of 5-1 to one dominant to tonic movement, which is a perfect candidate or our sub five. And I see so right away when I go from measure two to measure three. So this was a two, five, one. So what we're gonna do here is a two sub five to one. So let's substitute out this G7 chord that targets a C with the sub five. So I can think of it like this. I can say, okay, I'm targeting a C. What's a half step above C? Uh, D flat, and then boom, I know what my sub five is. So before we had, we had this. So now let's swap out the G7 for the D flat seven. We'll get this. Beautiful, and both, both work. The G7 creates this tension release when we go to the C, just like the sub five does. So now just know this, anywhere you're looking at the chart and you see a solid arrow, you can swap it out for the sub five. And it works both ways. You can swap out a sub five for its five, so you could take that E flat seven sharp 11 and measure eight, that goes to D minor seven, and you just play the five of D minor seven there, A seven. And the reason these two chords are so interchangeable, and the reason that they work so well with one another is that they have the same exact tritone within them. So in other words, the G seven, now we swapped out in measure two, has this tritone between the third, the B, and the seven the F, the D flat seven that we swapped it out for contains the same tritone, only now it's between the seventh and the third. So that tritone and the tension there within so greatly defines the G seven or the D flat seven that either one of them work.